Good evening, everybody. I'm Megan Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream conversation with Rick Perlstein and Tom Nick. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral land. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization and a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if it means we can't gather in person. I'd like to thank Rick and Tom for appearing tonight to help make that possible. Town Hall will be continuing to produce virtual content this fall, and many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form on our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Suzanne Knockle with Dinwa Minute 2 on free speech. To Ketsu Nabisa about the benefits uh, to countries who receive immigrants, our first civic cocktail of the season presented with City Club featuring Denise Juno, Adrian Diaz, and Harriet Walden, and more. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large have been put under significant strain due to the event cancellations and ever changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation by clicking on the donate button at the bottom of your screen or becoming a member. You can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. Our partner booksellers have been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak and can use your support as well. If you are interested in supporting local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase your television. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about 40 minutes followed by two you Turn off the air conditioning, hon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Rick and Tom will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions will be addressed by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We cannot guarantee that we will be able to address every question, but we will try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Network Foundation, True Brown Foundation, KEOW, and Winco Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Rick Perlstein is the best-selling author of Nixon Land and The Invisible Bridge. His essays and book reviews have been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Nation, and The Village, the Village Voice, and Split, among others. He is a contributing editor and board member of the In These Times magazine. Tom Nestle is the owner of Skinny Books. He is an eight-time champion on Jeopardy and former Amazon book editor. He holds a PhD in English literature and has written for the Paris Review Daily, The Millions, and The Shakespeare. Prostein's book, Reagan Land, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Rick Prostein and Tom. Hi. Hi Am I muted? Can you hear me? You can hear I can, me. I hear you fine. Okay, okay, <laughs> I'm the only one who counts. Like. <laughs> Take it away, Tom. All right. Thanks. Uh, so I'm in the back of Finney Books. Uh, Rick is in Chicago, I assume. Um, and I guess the first thing I want to say is congratulations. Uh, this has been a long road. Uh, how many years in your own life and how many years in American history? I began working uh, on this project in 1997. So it's almost half my life, 23 years, I'm 50. And uh, the saga, the first book before the storm, Barry Gold, Goldwater and the Unmaking of the American Consensus begins uh, in the aftermath of the 1958 congressional elections. So we're talking uh, 22 years of history. Okay. 23 years of history writing. Yeah. And was this always the plan, 58 to 80? It was. I don't know quite how it formed in my mind, but I read um, uh, Taylor Branch's Martin Luther King series. 
Yeah. And I think that something uh, like that began forming in my brain when I started thinking about writing a book about the rise of the right in the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'm, you know, one of the fascinating aspects of the project is, unlike Taylor Branch writing about King, you're not writing about your heroes politically. Right. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then we can get into this. I mean, I think one of the things that I think is fascinating about the books is the way you often can't tell. Um, mm. And was that uh, something you had in mind from the beginning also? That, of not being able to... Well, uh, that you were going to present this in a pretty even-handed... There's, diff there's definitely someone from the left writing the history of the right. right. There's yeah. could be done in a very different way. Well, I think that my perspective is sort of ethnographic, right? So that I'm trying to uh, write about a culture that's foreign to myself, right? Uh, when, uh, I, when I kind of look back into the prehistory of how I got interested in this subject, I think of as a kid, you know, waking up early on Sunday mornings and for some reason ending up watching uh, TV preachers, you know, in thick Southern accents, you know, talking about the blood of the lamb and being absolutely riveted by the idea that America had all these tribes, right? Uh, that were completely foreign to me. And then when I got closer to thinking about this sort of project, uh, I became much more interested in political history uh, in 1994 when Newt Gingrich's, you know, revolutionaries took over Congress. And I realized that there were just millions and millions of people who saw the world in a different way than I did. Then the next year, I was absolutely galvanized by the Oklahoma City bombing and kind of the right word fringe of that kind of right wing uh, uh, shift in American political culture. And so I've always been interested uh, in anthropology too, at the idea of the idea of, you know, empathetic portraits of people who see the world differently from you, from, from the way you do, but from the way one, oneself does. But at the same time, I write as a citizen. So I do think that there's a moral valence to them. Uh, I think I don't say this person is bad or this person is good, but I think that I don't hide my hand. You know, when someone does something meretricious or dangerous uh, in my accounts, you know, I'll say so. But I'll say so whether they're a Democrat or whether they're a Republican. I don't necessarily think Jimmy Carter comes out of this one smelling like a rose either. So... <laughs> Yeah, I, the truth is, I see it without fa fear or favor, and devil take the hindmost. Yeah, uh, and I remember when the first book came out, I think you got a lot of praise from the right. I did. They were very happy that someone was paying attention to this neglected history. I think. Yeah, has that continued through the books? Do you, do you sense you've had that same reception? Not so much. I think that. Um, I think. If anything, uh, I was a little too, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say respectful because I respect all my subjects, but uh, let's say I took for granted uh, their own self-representations a little bit more than I do now. And, and one of the things they talked about was that they were these underdogs, you know, that they were completely uh, martyred by the forces of, you know, the dominant political culture. And I think that that was a little bit, as we all kind of appreciate now, it's a little bit performative, shall we say. And uh, as, um, um, you know, when you're writing about, you know, Richard Nixon and mm -hmm. the fact that so many people on the right uh, began to look at Richard Nixon almost as a role model. You know, I, I once wrote about a, a right wing activist who said uh, to me that I didn't admire Nixon until Watergate. This was kind of an owning the lib kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, and then as I, you know, kind of wrote about um, a lot more of the consequences of once, you know, conservatives began to gain a little bit more power uh, in American life and began writing a lot more journalism about those consequences. I think that um, some, some people on the right have remained um, respectful interlocutors, which was kind of like a culture on the right among kind of an older generation. They were a lot more kind of comfortable of kind of, you know, hanging out with liberals and being fascinated by people who are fascinated by politics. It's a lot more different now. I think the kids are a little more kind of cutthroat and 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 uh, a little bit more um, insular when it comes to that sort of thing. But I think that uh, my readership and fan base on the right, uh, it's fair to say, is uh, pretty slim these days. Which is fine. I don't care who reads me. You know? Yeah. Um, so let's set the stage uh, for Reaganland. Uh, 
It opens, so after the 76 election, right. uh, Reagan has- it flashes kind of, back to the 1976 election too. I would yeah. say it opens after um, the timeline, shall we say, the, to, to use a popular phrase these days, starts with Ronald Reagan losing the right. 1976 Republican nomination to the incumbent president, Gerald Ford. But he ran this in surprisingly successful insurgent campaign. He took it all the way to the convention. Conventions used to take place, it was rather um, frequent uh, until right. really the 1980s that you didn't necessarily know who the candidate was gonna be until the convention was over. And the 1976 Republican convention was probably the last one, uh, well, no, there's a 1980 Democrat convention. I was going to say that <laughs> yeah. the book is when kind of framed Kennedy by some of those conventions. The convention, uh, in very similar, in very similar fashion, right. uh, had uh, fewer delegates, but tried to force a rules fight in both cases that would possibly shake loo loose enough delegates to uh, a hail mary pass, shall we say, to carry things out in the last inning. So that's when it starts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, to jump ahead to 80, like mm -hmm. it is fast. I, I'm not sure I'd ever. And we were just saying that picked up on the parallel yeah. that you know the Kennedy and and Reagan, uh, and then they both kind of felt like they emotionally won those conventions. Okay. Uh, speeches that left the delegates in tears, right? And, you know the incumbent president kind of looking like kind of like um, very kind of limp and not particularly interesting. I think the bigger picture on 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 that is. Uh, when you pull back and look at the big shifts in political culture in the 1970s, the, dis the growing distrust of institutions and kind of uh, much more kind of uh, individualism and a lot less deference to the powers that be uh, as a product of the 60s and, you know, the loss in Vietnam and Watergate and uh, the idea that kind of party organizations were old fashioned and not to be trusted. Uh, well, let's talk about organizations because on the face of it, the big character, I mean, they're the two guys on the cover of your book, Carter and Reagan, uh, they're the main characters, but one might argue that the main character or a main character to use is Richard. I don't even know how to say his name. Richard Vigory. Is that how you say his name? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, he, and, you know, standing for a certain group of people, uh, but in your story, he really comes across and what he represents as the real story running underneath right. all the headlines. Let's talk about this guy. So Richard yeah. Gray was known as the godfather of the new right. And the new right is a phrase people use not quite accurately, referred some, to something very specific, which was a, a group of cutthroat kind of Republican operatives that came to the fore in the mid 1970s. They were very, like, like we say, anti-institutional had contempt for the leadership of both parties. And as far as conservatism went, uh, they thought that the people running the Republican Party were this kind of out of touch country club, club elite. And they were really the first conservatives who talked concertedly about reaching out to middle class and lower middle class, kind of rural alienated white Americans in much the way you know Donald Trump does now. And they, shared an ideology with you know the previous generation of conservatives they they certainly all came you know of age in the Barry Goldwater crusade in 1964 but Barry Goldwater you know made his made his appeal to the electorate by saying you know I'm going to make social security voluntary I'm going to get rid of the Tennessee Valley Authority and sell it to private industry uh, I'm going to get rid of farm subsidies all these radical economic ideas that of course completely fell flat with the electorate. Oh, and by the way, he said, I'm gonna you know, push the Soviets to the wall and if it leads to a nuclear war, you know, we're man enough to take it too, right? <laughs> uh, these guys uh, were a lot more cunning. Uh, what they did was they, they said that their uh, method was organizing discontent. And what that meant was they would kind of scan the political horizon and find things that basically were pissing people off. And whatever that was, they would use that as a wedge to get these people into the conservative coalition by kind of magnifying their hatred of liberalism using the most emotional appeals possible. And the best way they found to do that was, uh, as one of them put it, uh, that he said, sex is the Achilles heel of the liberal, Repub liberal Democrats. So they, they, they were fascinated by the idea of weaponizing opposition to abortion 
weaponizing opposition to uh, feminism and how it's a kind of transforming family roles, uh, weaponizing uh, hatred, fear, absolutely feral anger at gay rights and homosexuality. Uh, a lot of these guys uh, were former segregationists who just kind of seamlessly transformed their anger at uh, civil rights activists into anger at, at gays. Uh, and the long story that I tell over the four years in the book is that the activists led by Richard Viguerie uh, pioneered very brilliant new techniques of reaching voters like direct mail, which was kind of like the kind of email forwards or Facebook manipulation of 1980, um, 1978, 1976. Richard Viguerie had been uh, a staffer of the conservative youth group, Young Americans for Freedom. And after the Goldwater election, he had the idea to go to the clerk of House of Representatives, which was where campaign law, by campaign law then in place, uh, reposed all the addresses of everyone who gave $50 or more to the Goldwater campaign. And he had what were then called Kelly girls, what we now call temps, um, just basically descend upon this office and start scrawling down names and addresses of Goldwater supporters. And before they got kicked out, they had 10,000 names. And this 10,000 names, he said, were basically his bricks, gold bricks in, in, in his political Fort Knox. And those became the foundation of um, these, 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 these massive computer data banks of people who would receive these letters about how the liberals want to take your guns away. The liberals want to teach your children that homosexuality is okay. The liberals want to uh, force your you out of the home if you're a woman and into the workplace. And uh, this stuff was going on completely under the radar of right. the political media. And these guys kept on winning elections and everyone, no one knew, knew what was happening until they figured out. Uh, Richard Vagary said direct mail is like a water mo moccasin, silent but deadly. And the thing that makes this so important in the evolution of the Reagan story is that Richard Vigory realized that if he could weaponize a certain block of leaders and voters, that they could kind of lock in these political gains forever. And that block of voters was evangelical and fundamentalist Christians who had not really been involved in politics because politics was seen as this worldly thing that kept your eyes off you know, the real goal, which was getting into heaven. And around these very emotional social issues, around issues like abortion, around issues like gay rights, um, they became one of the most fearsome organizing forces in American politics and turned millions of Americans who had never been involved in politics before into political activists. And, you know, the, the most famous leader uh, was uh, Jerry Falwell, whose um, son was Funny that. jammed up. No one who reads my book will be surprised about anything <laughs> wicked, meretricious, uh, 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 um, hypocritical, violent, uh, 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 chicanery that uh, any Christian right person does. Uh, Pat Robertson was one of these guys, and right. he said that God would much rather have um, uh, a crook in charge and law and order, uh, what's a, cr a crook and stability uh, is much better than a morally pure person and instability. So that was his way of explaining why he was perfectly willing to go to the wall against Jimmy Carter. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. With, with these forces of liberalism, and he'd given an uh, interview to Playboy magazine, and he was even though he was a Southern Baptist, he was definitely in league with the devil. Yeah, I mean that. Uh, you know, I this is the first of your books that I felt like I had really lived through, so it was <laughs> interesting to see where you know I was. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was I was kind of a political junkie, and by age 10 or 11, I was following all this stuff. And so it was interesting to see where surprises for me came up. And one was that Carter had a lot of evangelical support right. when he was first elected. Right, There's the, I have a scene uh, when I'm in the first chapter when I'm describing this 1976 showdown between Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford, um, in which Gerald Ford's uh, campaign team is meeting in the office of a fellow named Mr. Cheney. Uh, who uh, one of the guys notices has a man-sized safe in the corner. Uh, and um, the pollster, a guy named Robert Teeter, uh, is talking about all this statistics about how, you know, 50 million Americans are born again. And everyone's kind of giggling and tittering and saying they need to um, draft um, 
Oral Roberts, the faith healer, you know, as their as their candidate. And he says, "Don't laugh. This is this is absolutely serious because these guys have a, their own precinct organization. You know, these are the churches, and this could be the most powerful force in American politics. And Jimmy Carter is plugged right into it because he was a very out and proud Southern Baptist evangelical. Uh, you know, he still teaches Sunday school. He uh, did a mission in the South Bronx in the you know 1950s. Uh, the thing about it is, he was a traditional Southern Baptist." in which kind of uh, wearing your faith on your sleeve and bringing it into the public square was anathema. Uh, and uh, one of the fascinating kind of monkey wrenches in that 1976 um, election, and you can read more about it in a piece I did on the Smithsonian website, is that he was much more interested in reaching out to all these different liberal constituencies. Uh, and that's why he agreed to do an interview with Playboy magazine. Right. And the fascinating thing about this interview in Playboy magazine is it's really the richest uh, deepest, most thoughtful, most illuminating uh, portrait of a presidential candidate's thinking that I think has ever existed in American politics. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, in the context of a very thoughtful, subtle theologi theological discussion in which the interview ask, interviewer asks him if him and his wife, Rosalind, are afraid of him being assassinated. And he says, no, because you know, he's washed in the blood of the lamb. And then he said, by the way, that doesn't mean I'm gonna be knocking down your door to see if you're fornicating because I don't believe in bringing my faith into the public sphere like that. Um, he gets into this very subtle analysis of the Christian doctrine of sin and redemption. And the way he illustrates it, speaking of Jerry Falwell Jr., uh, who honors this in the breach, is that he says, uh, I have left it in my heart many times, but I know that I've asked ask for forgiveness and God forgives me, right? right? Perfectly reasonable theological discussion. The press pounces on this. That's and all I remember from that. The campaign trail is lust, 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 and everyone's mocking Jimmy Carter. And this gives all these ev evangelical leaders, including Jerry Falwell, who's taken off the air in a hundred cities because he gives such a political sermon against Jimmy Carter, and Pat Robertson, uh, and a bunch of others, an excuse to, decouple uh, their flocks from loyalty to Jimmy Carter. Uh, Gerald Ford takes advantage of it. He, he gives a, um, he, he appears in the, 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 the church of a, a massive church, 10,000 seat church of this Dallas minister named W.S. Criswell, who is most famous for um, saying that if John F. Kennedy became president in 1960, the Vatican would you know, take, over America, uh, take over the White House. But by the late 70s, uh, all these sort of Orthodox Christians, whether they're Catholic or Mormon or Protestant evangelical are realizing that they have to get together on the same page and fight things like legal abortion and, and, and gay rights. They even come up with a theological word for it, co-belligerency. You know, who cares if they're going to hell? Let's fight together now. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy Carter uh, by 1980 is uh, an enemy of these people. Uh, and uh, 1979, Richard Vigory and Jerry Falwell get together and they form this organization called the Moral Majority. Jerry Falwell uh, is no less honest than his son. He uh, had been involved in a massive scam to defraud his uh, donors uh, and reached a settlement with the um, Securities and Exchange Commission. He said God had intended it for him so he could get his, you know, get his books in order. He was a, he was yeah. a scumbag. Uh, yeah. But he, 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 he mobilized this constituency that had never been involved in politics before. Mm -hmm. And uh, the results are before us. Um, yeah, I think for anybody going back to these years, uh, seeing what the landscape of who was a Republican, who was a Democrat, what, I mean, they, those parties still seemed like they had large ideological, uh, you know. There were pluralist parties, right? Yeah, both of them. Conservative right. was... Democrats and liberal Republicans. Yeah. But this really is the inflection point in which they're really sorting themselves out in the conservative and Republican camps. So right. all the like 12 candidates who are running, try, trying to become, win the Republican nomination going into 1980, uh, because Jimmy Carter by that time is, you know, seems like a sitting duck. All of them are running as conservatives, except for one. The one is this odd guy named named John Anderson, who feels so unwelcome in the party that after he, you know, starts losing primaries, 
he decides he's going to become a um, independent and he gets on the ballot in all 50 states and his biggest supporter is Walter Cronkite. We love them. Walter yeah. Cronkite, you know, uh, a rumor swirls around that Walter Cronkite has been asked to be his vice president. And there's a joke that if Volvos could have voted, that John Anderson <laughs> would have been the president. So he was kind of like the, 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 the candidate for kind of these, you know, high minded, you know, kind of, uh, they're probably, he probably had some good support in Seattle, probably in Portland, you know, um, people who, um, fancied themselves above, you know, kind of the hurly burly of partisan politics. The rational voter. Rational yeah. voter. Yeah. That's right. And you know, his, his, his big, his big campaign promise was a 50 cent per gallon gas tax. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can watch in those four years, the people getting picked off on both sides, you know, in, in house yeah. races and Senate races. That's they're they're beginning to shift into the Republican Party. You begin. Uh, it, it's interesting that we all. I think if you we study American history, we know about the Southern strategy, right? We know that Richard Nixon decided that the way to you know to to, to guarantee the fortunes of the Republican Party was to reach out to conservative, racist voters in the South, right? And but in 1976, when Jimmy Carter wins. People are like, well, that was a great idea, but that lasted eight years, and now we got yeah. what we need to do is run these Southerners, and and they can run the table in the South, and people can, you know, because the the Republicans like never won electoral votes in the South, right? Because the the Republican Party was Lincoln's party; they were the party that was you know like empowering African Americans, right? And there was still that kind of um, antipathy that almost that almost a phobia of Republicans. Um, but you know, lo and behold, Southern Strategy 2.0 is is only uh, organized around race kind of implicitly, the real explicit appeal is to these, you know, Southern evangelicals. And uh -huh. um, so you begin to really see um, people like the Trent Lotts, uh, Thad Cochran's, uh, uh, Jesse Helms is, you know, one of them. And, and, and um, Strom Thurmond was the early adopter. He became a Republican in 1964. So it's very hard to argue that the Republicans are, are and Democrats are diverse multi ideology ideology coalitions by the by the end of the nineteen eighty election. So that's one of the stories the books tell. Yeah, that was in, yeah because I it does feel like race in these years played a lesser role at least on the surface. On the uh, surface, yeah, subconsciously. And, and Lee Atwater yeah. was a character, right? Uh, Lee Atwater was the yeah. cutthroat. He was one of these kind of you know new right infl in, in, in inflected. Uh, people who kind of came out of the, you know, Nixon Watergate world. Uh, his 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 partners in crime, with whom he formed a um, consulting company during the 1980 election, were Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. Yes. And uh, Lee Atwater ran um, Ronald Reagan's 1980 primary in South Carolina, which was like the state where all the nastiest cutthroat politics happens. And he would do things like he ran a uh, Ronald Reagan commercial that made it seem like William F. Buckley was endorsing Reagan because William F. Buckley's brother lived in North South Carolina. He sounded exactly like William F. Buckley. But, <laughs> but Lee Atwater is the guy. This is when Lee Atwater gives this famous interview in which he says, you can't use the N-word anymore because that'll cause a backlash. And in fact, even when Reagan goes to, gives this famous speech in Mississippi at the Neshoba County Fair, to kick off his campaign and he says he's for states rights, which was a traditional kind of Southern code word that actually caused a backlash. And right. he didn't actually do that well in Mississippi. No one wanted to think that they were a racist by then. This was the era of colorblind conservatism. I mean, when you read documents in the 1960s, people will say, I am a racist. You know, I love white people. You know, I hate black as, people. As but they nope, do now again. <laughs> right? But Lee Atwater gives this famous interview that next year in which he says, well, now you just kind of make it more abstract. You talk about taxes, you know, yeah. you talk about good schools and that's where you get into, you know, kind of the dog whistle politics. So race is obviously still there, but the kind of, you know, murderous rage that you heard in the fifties and the sixties in the South towards African-Americans, you hear now towards gays and lesbians. So mm -hmm. Jerry Falwell, you know, intervenes in a big gay rights fight in Miami, Miami County, Dade County in 1977. Uh, a famous orange juice pitch woman, Anita, Anita Bryant, you know, is, is leading Save Our Children. And Jerry Falwell gives a speech there in, in which he says, a homosexual will just as soon kill you as look at you. And there's another guy named James Robeson, who's kind of like the second most famous 
preacher. He's still around and he's very close to the Bush family. And in 1979 and his show, he says that gays are recruiting young boys and murdering them. And his station says, you can't do this. We're taking you off the air. And he becomes a martyr. And it's one of the galvanizing events of the Christian right. Mike Huckabee is uh, his, his, his staffer and he organizes a massive rally in a basketball stadium with 10,000 people uh, who are just cheering lustily for his right to be able to say that gays uh, are, you know, like QAnon, killing children. And uh, Mike Huckabee in an interview thought, re recalled that event. And he said, if, if, if James Robeson had told the audience to walk out of the arena and tear down the station brick by brick, they would have done it. Hmm. So, and nothing, nothing we're seeing now, that level of kind of um, rage among these people uh, is particularly new. Um, yeah, I'm sure you, uh, I was gonna come to this at some point, but uh, and here we are. often asked to comment on current events. Uh, we've yeah. already mentioned Jerry Falwell Jr. But just that sense, and I, I've, I've heard you say this before that, that sense that we're living in unprecedented times, uh, I would, I, I assume you would say that in many ways they are precedented. Well, I don't think people know this history very well. And one of the reasons is um, Americans desperately, like Ronald Reagan, want to believe in the innocence of their own nation, right? So, um, and the media, of course, is absolutely desperate to maintain this notion that there are two sides and they are equally legitimate uh, to somehow, you know, appear, you know, avoid the appearance of bias. Uh, and so the fact that, you know, in our bosom, you know, there's a rose, this um, political movement, you know, Jerry Falwell, right? Let me, let me give you an example of Jerry Falwell. Um, if you read about him in like the New York Times in, in the nineteen in nineteen eighty, you would they 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 present him as just kind of one more voice uh, in this kind of plural American conversation, right? He's a respectable figure, and you know the Los Angeles Times gives him you know like space to write an op-ed about what the Christian right wants, you know, just a few days before the election, you know, over there on my you know kind of shelf where I keep all my crazy tracts. You know, I have a pamphlet that Jerry Falwell wrote that came out during the 1980 presidential election with a giant mushroom cloud on the front, right? And it's a little pamphlet and page by page, it explains using biblical prophecy, exactly how World War III is gonna happen, exactly what troops are gonna mass where, you know, when the Chinese are gonna cross the River Jordan, et cetera, et cetera. It says that you're writing Ezekiel. And then the last page says, you know, and then, Boom! The, the you know the nuclear Armageddon is going to happen, and Christ's children are going to be raptured up to heaven. And the last line of the book, in big letters, exclamation point! And what a glorious day that will be! Yeah. So this is the and kind this, of right. So yeah. so people are really surprised, you know, <laughs> what's happening now that you know there are people there are, there are crazy people that have taken over the Republican Party and are you know kind of in the White House and that this. White supremacist Steve Miller is, you know, running immigration policy. And, um, and this week, the Secretary of State will be speaking at the convention from Jerusalem. Am I? Is do I have that right? I did not know <laughs> that. Wow. I, yeah, that, I, I think I just saw that come across Twitter today. Yeah, but the Zionism thing really begins in the late seventies. When once um, Israel is a lot like America in that way. When 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 um, Menachem Begin became president of prime minister of Israel in 1977, he comes from this right wing tradition in Israel called revisionist Zionism. You know, um, Benjamin Netanyahu is you know the exemplar of that. His dad was the right hand man to this guy Jabotinsky, who was basically a Jewish fascist. Right? He said Jewish Jews have to be hard. You know, when I was growing up in Sunday school and Hebrew school, the Israel I learned about was all. You know, Israeli dancing, and it was very hippie. The and the, and yeah, was, yeah, exactly. We didn't know that there were these. You know, that like Menachem Begin was like bragging about you know massacring people, and that you know in the 1940s he was a terrorist, like blew up the King David Hotel, right? So I have a textbook. It's like a, it's like Israeli history for Sunday school kids in the 70s. It came out like 77, and they actually had to like stick a page in the back that talks about 
<laughs> you know, the Likud party because it was so written out of the standard narrative. In that same way, the standard narrative of American history has, you know, not really written out this reactionary policy, but politics, but really kind of domesticated it, right? So once you begin to look, dug, dig in the guts and you recover this stuff, um, you realize not so much that Trump comes as a surprise, but that the Trumpian strain in the Republican party didn't really fit the narrative that kind of the establishment was telling about America. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in the QAnon, that, that American, really tough, American right? berserk to use the, the Philip right. Roth term. It, it, it seems inconceivable that people believe this, but look, I mean, this is what James Robeson was saying that, that, that gays were recruiting and chill, killing children. And, you know, like Jeffrey Epstein, actually is running a child sex ring. So that every conspiracy theory has some reality to it. You know, there was John Wayne Gacy, you know, who, who you know, was recruiting kids and killing them and, and burying them in his basement. But by the other hand, by the other token, there was, um, what's his name? Uh, the guy who represented himself um, who, and who murdered sorority girls and he'd been a Republican activist. God, I can't. <laughs> You ask a question and I'll look, look it up in the, in the pictures. <laughs> uh, well, I think we should talk a little bit about the, the title character. Uh, and uh, to what extent does Ronald Reagan come from that American berserk? Or does That's he become an so he plays the creature a very of them? Or yeah. does he harness them? Uh, he's a, he remains a fascinating character. I... I'm curious, you know, he's, you know, his, his, his biographer at, oh, <laughs> oh sure. Seattle's, Seattle's, <laughs> Seattle's favorite son. son. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you really know, Reagan, his, his, this enigmatic character, even to his, his most famous biographer, Edmund Morris, who I famously had to make a novel out of his biography. Nancy Reagan said he doesn't even let me in sometimes. So she was yeah. in history even to her. Right. So where, what's your sense of his relation to these, these powers? Are they using him? Is he using them? That's, uh, that's the kind of, that's the kind of question that yields a 900 page book. <laughs> Although most of this stuff about kind of Reagan's psyche and how it relates to uh, the long, bigger questions of political culture and his own biography is in my previous book, Invisible Bridge. But um, I did an article in the New Republic um, uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago in which I write about two sets of letters that I found. Uh, uh, one was in the Reagan library and one was in the, the, the papers of um, basically these, 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 these right-hand men kind of advisors of him, Deeper and Hannaford that were at the Hoover Institution. And one, one set of letters is called, it was called the Sign Personally Program. And it was in which staffers wrote letters for him to sign, which, you know, people do for politicians. And they were universally directed at establishment newspaper columnists, intellectuals, uh, authors, um, moderate public officials. And they were quite explicitly designed to market Ronald Reagan to them as within the respectable mainstream of political opinion. And they were very phony. Right. So there'd be a letter in which Ronald Reagan would sign it and say, uh, I read your book. It's fascinating. And then there'd be a note attached to it saying, Governor, you know, uh, don't feel obliged to read the book <laughs> that this guy Just sign it. <laughs> Just sign it. Right? Yeah. And then there's another set of letters, which is in his, um, which is in uh, um, box one of his papers. <laughs> so I'm not surprised for stories I haven't talked about this before. And it's his, um, his dictated letters to his friends, his old buddies, you know, from the football team and, you know, his Hollywood buddies, but they're often to much more extreme political figures, you know, uh, McCarthyite figures, um, a bunch of letters to Gene Dixon, the, the newspaper psychic, right. and nuts, right? And he'll talk- and he's to, talking to, about Armageddon, right? We talk about how um, what's happening in the Middle East, you know, uh, really resembles what you see in biblical prophecy, you know, that kind of Jerry Falwell stuff. And the striking thing about Ronald Reagan as a figure is that sort of backstage and front stage element? The never the twain shall meet, right? He was a, he was a guy who was very good at you know listening to his advisors, right, and signing letters that they told him to, and not saying things that he wasn't supposed to say in public, but he often did say them in public, right? So that was a big one of the fun things in the book 
is them, you know, kind of literally there's a case where like the, the reporters are being tackled by his press secretary. You know, basically, says, he's talking, he's talking. Right. So that's 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 the that's that's the Reagan we laugh at. Right. It's the right. Saturday Night Live sketch where he's turns out to be a genius once, you know, once everyone's left. Uh, you know, this is the guy who started in bedtime for Bonzo. Um, but at the same time, he had this absolute brilliance as a communicator. I mean, this is a guy who at the same time as he's reaching out to these Mississippi you know, white people and saying states rights literally won the endorsement of Martin Luther King's best friend from the Southern Christian Leadership Council, uh, Ralph Abernathy. This is the guy in whose arms Martin Luther King died and he managed to convince Abernathy of his goodwill uh, on racial matters, right? So he had this unbelievable, unbelievable gift for communicating, but at the heart of his appeal was something really uh, pretty novel in conservative politics. And it was this ability to convey this unfettered boundless optimism about America uh, and to kind of see redemption where everyone else saw chaos. Uh, and this is really, this gets to the psyche of a guy who, you know, grew up in a very dysfunctional alcoholic home with a mother who was always gone saving souls, you know, and uh, moved so often when he was a kid that, you know, it's, it's very easy to imagine him uh, um, forgetting his address, right? And as I point out in The Invisible Bridge, his own stories that he told are, are, are full of horrors. Sure. You know, this one time in which he was left alone, he was playing with his friend and they found a gun and they sh shot the gun. But he always manages to turn the most horrifying stories into these radiant morality tales that have happy endings. That is the core of Ronald Reagan's being. And that's what he's able to do. And that's what he's able to kind of bring to this movement that's full of, you know, ugly right. you know, American carnage elements but he's able to kind of front it in a way that makes it quite palatable, not only palatable to kind of, you know, these kind of white voters in the suburbs, you know, the swing voters of, you know, 2016, but also to these media elites who are convinced that this guy eventually, eventually a lot of them are convinced that he's a guy that, you know, deserves their respect. And it's fascinating and it's a skill. Uh, and um, it's a lot more complicated than, you know, he's an idiot who was run from behind the scenes. Right. Uh, but he uh, af he absolutely knew um, uh, basically how to delegate. And uh, he was very un-Trump-like in several aspects. One of them is that Donald Trump has no front stage and backstage, right? He's the quiet part out loud guy. Other elements, you know, um, um, Ronald Reagan loved immigration. You know, um, in the in the, in the 1980 uh, Texas primary, him and George W. Bush, it's a Texas showdown, are competing with each other to see who can say the nicest things in the debate about about not just Mexican immigrants, but undocumented Mexican immigrants. Hmm. And, you know, Ronald Reagan's opening speech of his campaign in November of 1979, we remember, um, you know, the opening speech of the general election campaign in Neshoba, but his opening speech in New York, he called for open borders between the U.S. and Mexico, and then his handlers had him go to Cicero, Chicago, which is like you know a place where if a white person, black person, walked through you know town, he'd be shot. You know, so this stuff is is very complicated. It yeah. doesn't lend itself to you know easy black and white categories. Um, well, I want to open it up to questions. I have one more of my own, uh, at least, but. Uh, your sister Linda sent around a picture, I think, on Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> so uh, how old were you in this picture um, in Milwaukee? Maybe 14 or 15. Well, yeah. it was 1984. 84. 15. Yeah, 15. Yeah. yeah. And could you describe the photograph? Is it a vi yeah, the video or the photograph? Oh, oh I maybe there was a there's that. Sorry, that's right. There's actual video. Are you going to show it? We could have shown it. Ah, I I should have uh, not prepared. Well, could have prepared. No, I'm actually I'm wearing a white turtleneck and white pants, and I'm in a like a kind of kids singing group, and we're entertaining at a event with Ronald Reagan and Nancy. I can't <laughs> believe we didn't queue up the video. They asked yeah. me if I want TV. Uh, what, what, how did how did you end up there? Oh, I mean, I think that like you know, um, uh, we were Linda and I were in this ridiculous group that sang show tunes and the song and dance group, much like kind of Milo does in Seattle, you know, right. um, Broadway bound. I, I'm talking about my 12 year old nephew. And, uh, you know, I mean, they just 
you know, some advanced man was like, we need kids. You were <laughs> you know, not Republican we, kids. You know, you smiling. Just... Well, he's the president, right? And what did you, do you remember? Like, was that a formative moment for you or is just kind of some, <laughs> like, as, as a kid interested in politics? Many things to uh, win one's parents' approval. Uh, <laughs> uh, and adolescence is a very confusing time. Right. Uh, and uh, I don't think we need to say anything more than that. I think <laughs> while that was going on, I probably went home and got in my argument with my parents. Uh, you know, my, my dad was probably um, telling me that I would, you know, like lose these crazy Bolshevik ways once I had to make a payroll with a real grown up. And my mom probably said, I don't understand why there's any homeless people when there's so many want ads in the paper, you know? <laughs> what can I tell you? Yeah. Now uh, you tell me when you were 15 that you're embarrassed by. Uh, I really loved Jimmy Carter. I have to say as a kid, it was just, yeah. I mean, I, as I said, this was the first, you know, these years are the first years I was waking up as a political. You're wearing a Jimmy Carter yeah. shirt. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I, I've got a Hamilton Jordan. I, I was going to get a haircut this week, but I thought I would <laughs> hold off in yeah, honor of it. Jody Powell and Hamilton Jordan and yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of keep well, the so, shag. So I got a really interesting call from a political reporter at the AP. And he was just kind of sounding me out to think of, asked me if I thought this was a good idea. Um, and it was, uh, he wanted to write an essay um, about Jimmy Carter to have in the bank, shall we say, unfortunately, um, right. uh, you know what I mean? Uh, about Jimmy Carter as basically the political version of the 1970s singer songwriter, you know, in the yeah. final, you know, kind of like <laughs> sure. dip in the soil and talking about the truth and how that sort of vision of uh, basically both politics and pop music, you know, was kind of out the window by 1980, which I kind of write about right. too. It's going yacht rock by then, you know. Yeah, and metal and hair metal. Um, so let's see, uh, enough about my hair. Um, so some questions from the town hall audience. Uh, so Charles uh, Montaigne said, asks, Heather Cox Richardson speaks of movement mm. conservatism, victorious under Reagan as originating with the slave power pre-Civil War. Please yeah. comment. That's a, that's, a, that's a very sound observation. A lot, you know, if you wanted to summarize what happens, you know, basically what is happening in this, you know, 30 year sweep of the histories I'm writing, a lot of it is the southernization of the United States at the same time as the, the, the northernization of the South, right? So in 1964, uh, when uh, Barry Goldwater wins the nomination and kind of steals the nomination from the main, the, the kind of Wall Street uh, moderates who are running the Republican Party at the time, he does this with the political energy of the Southern delegates. And one of them tells a reporter that we've shoved the Mason-Dixon line clear up to Canada, right? And Barry Goldwater, of course, his calling card as a candidate was he was the guy who voted against the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And a lot of the vision of the world that I would not say everyone in the South is, uh, Holds because of course the South is largely African American, but certainly the elites in the South uh, have basically cultivated since the 18th century is much more um, feudalist in vision, you know, in which mm -hmm. there's a natural order of society. Uh, uh, the mudsill theory that there always has to be a group way on the bottom and using the kind of um, notion of race and uh, an inferior race in order to uh, dominate the white working class by telling them that no matter how oppressed they are, they're always better than these people who they have to keep their their heel on. So I think that's a very, um, you know, it's a good, it's a good, um, it's a good sort of um, ideal type for understanding what uh, the right wing ascendancy in America is all about. Uh, a big kind of watershed is when um, George Wallace the governor of Alabama, who in 1963 gives an inaugural speech in which he says segregation, yes, segregation today, segregate, segregation yesterday, segregation forever, and stands in the schoolhouse door rather than letting an African-American enter the University of Alabama, wins, doesn't win, but does respectably well in three primaries against Lyndon Johnson in the North, in Wisconsin, in Maryland, in Indiana. So yeah. it basically, uh, then two years later, the first civil rights bill to fail uh, uh, 
after the vote, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights, of Na- Rights Act of 1965 is an open housing bill that's going to not just affect the South, but the whole country. It suddenly reveals that this is not just a Southern thing, that they had this thing called segregation down South, uh, but uh, that this is, you know, a national problem that's uh, weaponizable mm-hmm. by Republicans. And then the party realignment kind of brought it to the surface in a different way, it seems like. Yeah, well, famously, Lyndon Johnson tells Bill Moyers when he signs the right. Civil Rights Bill that I've just signed away the South. But I've, but I, but he wins the loyalty of the North because African Americans in Northern cities are never going to vote for Republicans again, and of course, don't. Uh, okay, a question um, from Santiago: How, if at all, has Trump's election affected your work and scholarship? Has ex- has his success changed in retrospect the narrative of American conservatism success? It absolutely has. Um, the previous narrative that I kind of kept in my mind, uh, even if my work didn't necessarily always reflect it, was that in order to succeed succeed uh, in American politics, the conservative movement had to um, um, purge the most extremist elements. Uh, that uh, is very hard to sustain. And if, if you look at the fact that the conservative movement has you know, embraced Trump you know, with almost 90% approval ratings. You know, if people c- who call themselves conservative right, are embracing a guy who you know, exhibits all these authoritarian tendencies, you, know, you have to kind of take them at their word that this is what kind of conservatism is about. And the rise of Trump was actually very interesting for me personally because when that happened in 2015, I was incredibly burned out writing about this stuff because <laughs> whenever I read anything about the Republicans and the conservative movement, I could like finish the sentences. There were no surprises. Like the script was all, you know, kind of written. And um, what really made me realize that something new was happening was after Trump's announcement speech, um, uh, I forget whether it's Peter Osnos or Evan Osnos, uh, the New Yorker writer, once the father, once the son, wrote a wonderful piece about how he was happened to be reporting among white supremacists when Trump uh, announced his campaign and went down this, the, the escalator and said that Mexicans were you know, sending their rapists and that all these white supremacists who traditionally rejected both parties, you know, considered Fox News sellouts because they didn't acknowledge you know, the Zionist occupation government was pulling the strings, were all talking about this guy Trump as one of them. And I was like, wow, this is a little different. And uh, I immediately, I was writing for a publication. In fact, I remember writing in a cafe in Queen Anne, uh, writing one of my articles about this, whether Trump is a fascist. I was one of the first guys to kind of worry this question in 2015. And my my editor at this publication I was writing for, the Washington Pet Spectator says, why don't you write about the real candidates like Marco Rubio and and uh, Chris Christie and some of the guys name I forgot, you know? And yeah. I just kept writing about Trump. Yeah. Jeb. Yeah, Jeb. Uh, yeah, uh, I went, yeah. And um, I just kept on writing about Trump with this um, morbid fascination. And I'm not going to say that, you know, I was like my sister and I thought he was going to win. But um, I did uh, see people um, picking up his issues. All They were all calling for the end of birthright citizenship. And I realized that the whole um, idea of saying the quiet part loud was something that a lot of conservatives and a lot of Republicans were picking up as a welcome respite from the work of having to kind of manage this sort of backstage, front stage dynamic. Hmm. And that, you know, I knew from studying conservative history that there's this enormous kind of transcript below the surface of conservatives talking to each other. I've heard them do it that sound in which they sound like Donald Trump and then they kind of emerge above the surface and they sound like Bob Dole, you know, mm-hmm. or, or James Baker or Howard Baker or Jeb Bush. Um, and uh, that suddenly that, that membrane had been erased and that, that mm-hmm. was Trump's work. So that's the biggest, that's the biggest transition why Trump, the Trump era is different. Uh, it's basically the the erasure of that kind of membrane uh, in which you have to negotiate what you say in public and what's respectable 
uh, and kind of the work that you do underneath to try and kind of uh, plug into the most kind of feral kind of lizard brain segments of the electorate. You know, this is this is this is George. The example I use is George W. Bush saying Islam is a religion of peace and understanding as politicians previous to Trump have all understood that America is full of these very dangerous energies and that the the American political culture is a Pandora's box and you don't dare open it because then you might you might like when Barry Goldwater in 1964 when there were race riots right after the Republican convention and Barry Goldwater goes to the White House and he says to Lyndon Johnson, if I see people exploiting these riots in order to get me elected, I'll drop out of the race, right? That's the Pandora's box, right? right? Uh, Donald Trump is like, wow, riots, great, I can get elected. Yeah, well, it, I mean, that's, it's like McCain, uh, the guy who shouts from the audience, and McCain shuts him down right. uh, about Obama. And then the guy it's today- a negotiation, right? Because, uh, um, um, uh, Mitt Romney, you know, uh, he says, you know, oh, well, no one's ever had to ask to see my birth certificate. So that kind of razor's edge between dog whistle and train whistle that we saw in Neshoba, right, uh, is gone. Yeah. Uh, and then I don't know if you're following things today, but somebody shouted out about Obama to Trump while Trump was speaking today. Uh, and he did not shut him down. I'll just say that. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So Leanne asks, this book ends in 1980. Is there a cultural mm -hmm. phenomenon or political event from later that decade that you wish you could have covered maybe as a fitting epilogue? Uh, I heard a really good analysis of a risky business. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. It's a very Reaganite movie, right? Uh, in which, um, uh, it's a very Trumpite movie, actually, uh, in which, you know, right. basically, Guy gets into uh, Princeton by getting the Princeton recruiter laid, you know. Uh, so Trump uh, wished, it, wished he had done it so imaginatively instead of just yeah. paying somebody yeah. off. Uh, so, um, you know, I, the problem with writing a book about the 1980s is we talk about, you know, this is stuff. You know, the first thing I remember that I've written about, I wrote about in a book was something that happened on the day that Gerald Ford um, pardoned Richard Nixon, but it was. Um, Evil Knievel jumping over the snake over Canyon, right? We had a big political debate over that in, in, in the kindergarten. By the time it was like 1985 and I'm 16, you know, I need, I need to do like a hundred page chapter on like Michael Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> I had to do like a whole chapter on like the metallic sounds of digital synthesizers and 80, 80s pop. And, you know, then I'd have a 20,000 page book. It just doesn't work. So you have to work from a bit of a distance to get anything yeah. done. Going back to the 1830s after this, actually. <laughs> Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was, I don't want to interrupt, but I did want to ask what yeah. comes after this, this, yes. uh, yeah. this giant history of the 1830s, the guns, germs, and steel for uh, the rise of industrial capitalism and how it, um, uh, displaced traditional societies around the world. So across a global history, not just, yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, is that in four volume epic no, as well? In your page book, I think. Oh yeah, yeah thank you. Once you really you get something that huge, you obviously have to discipline yourself, right? <laughs> like Mormons, Trail of Tears, the Chartist movement, famines in Japan. Anyway, yeah, I could. You will go on, yeah. yeah uh, all right, let's see. Yeah. Uh, but I want to distill my wisdom for a short, short kind of guidebook for liberals called the Republican Playbook. That'll be a, like a kind of a hundred fifty pager. Kind of how to use the Republican tools for well, liberal not, ends. Not, them, you know, how basically distilling, you know, the various ways Republicans gain and seize power, kind of an art of war for, for liberals. Okay. Like the way, use, the, the way they use, the way they use Saul Alinsky, wasn't he like? Uh, uh, well, they misread Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky has contempt for electoral politics. So if, if Barack Obama really was an Alinsky, I never would have run for office. <laughs> yeah. He'd be trying to get like stoplights in neighborhoods. Uh, let's see. Laszlo asks, how how did the Hinckley assassination attempt hmm. affect, because that's just after your book ends, right. uh, how right. did it affect his popularity and his ability to sell his message? It was very, <laughs> it was very, uh, it was very good luck for him. It, yeah. He had a really very, it was in March of 1981, only two months after his, his inauguration. And he had a, one thing I don't really explicitly say in the book, but he had this very interesting and weird 
compulsion when it came to assassination and assassination attempts. Um, uh, Gerald Ford uh, had been, there had been two assassination attempts against him in September of 1975. And uh, uh, Ronald Reagan absolutely had two reporters jaws dropping at a dinner party in which he said, you know, Ford had shown himself to be not really kind of brave and courageous. I think mm -hmm. he ran through that scenario in his mind that he was going to kind of be a, a superhero. Of course, I did write a piece about how the Secret Service let him keep a handgun in his briefcase because he had this fantasy about helping them the next time it happened. Uh, that's, you know, that's the weird, that's the weird Reagan right there. Yeah. But no, I mean, it really um, turned him into a, a figure of great sympathy. Um, and uh, uh, it, it really links to the weirdness of you know the seventies and such a, I mean, I mean I think people and some people in the audience might be aware that uh, John Hinckley you know did this act Jody you know, Foster. Yeah. impressed Jody Foster because he had seen Taxi Driver and that's a movie about uh, uh, a guy who tries to assassinate a political figure to impress a teenage prostitute played by Jodie Foster. And that is based on an actual assassination attempt by a guy named Arthur Bremer, who left behind a diary, which was so bizarre uh, that it was one of, kind of the, one of the, the great classics of kind of like underground sort of paraliterature uh, of all time. So. And now we're back to George Wallace. And somehow we, you know, pretend that it's not, you know, yeah. American <laughs> work. Yeah. Uh, okay, Ken Hunt asks, will the ethnic demo demographic tsunami of non-whites, mm. you know, the, the coming democratic majority, as people have theorized for years, uh, eventually enable us to move on from and marginalize this weaponized conservatism forevermore? And if so, when? Well, didn't that already happen with Barack Obama? Was, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No, because, I mean, uh, demographic categories are, are arbitrary, right? I mean, it's like, um, one of the things all, you know, it's kind of graduate students who study, you know, 18th, 19th and 20th century history know is that the category whiteness is completely permeable, right? So, you know, I remember once I was at a, I was at a convention, uh, I was at a, um, like a, um, I was at a, a um, what do you call it? A, um, like a seminar on conservatism. And, and one of the people pointed out that the big question for the future is whether, um, whether Hispanics are going to end up being Jews or Italians, right? If they're Jews, they're Democrats. If they're Italians, mm -hmm. they're Republicans. Uh, you know, I mean, basically, the, the Republican Party tried to make Mexican Americans white. That's what that's what the big, you know, uh, post mortem analysis of the Obama campaign was about, and it didn't work. But maybe it, it will later. So this yeah. idea that um, uh, America will become majority minority. Uh, to use a good Marxist word, reifies these categories. You know, it's like uh, it might just have no one lets African Americans be white, right? But everyone else, it's fair game, right? Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous 19th century history book called How the Irish Became White. You know, uh, Jews were not considered white. You know, uh, uh, Eastern European immigrants were not considered white. They were, you know, um, ethnic others. So I, I don't think there's anything determinative about it. Nothing's written. Nothing's written in advance, and you know this is all up to us as citizens to make happen. Not you know um, demographic statistics. Yeah, and maybe that's that's what I'll the question all or the comment that I'll close with, and you can run with it as you wish. But one thing I love about reading a, a micro history like yours is just this it's sense of micro history. <laughs> I mean, just the kind of this is day by day sensation that you yeah. that you evoke again is this. Things that you think are settled are not settled and yeah. how fast that can change. So the one that, I mean, kind of one of the things you kind of open the book with is the ERA. Right. Um, which it was on the verge of passage. It seemed That's inevitable. It. And within weeks, it, it, shift, it went from inevitable to dead in the water. Uh, and just that sense of dynamics yeah. over and over when you think yeah, history is over. Is, uh, you know, George Bush and Ronald Reagan hating each other so much. And then suddenly George Bush is the running mate, which is a fun story in the book. And then here we have the Bush political dynasty. I mean, that was completely a completely a shock that you yeah. know, could never have been predicted in advance. Yeah, I mean, it's almost when, when you think things are settled, that's the time when they are the least settled. Donald Trump. 
Yeah. Donald yeah. Trump. Donald Trump. Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump. Do we end on those words? Donald Trump. <laughs> no, 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 no. We shall ever come. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any, any final words from the two? Well, uh, town Hall. This is my third appearance. Uh, it's a magnificent civic institution. I want to thank Tom, who I knew before he was a bookseller. Uh, he was my, his wife is my sister's college roommate back in the 80s. And uh, I hope to see you all in person someday. Yes, us too. And as we as well, we, we really wish we could have hosted this in our space. Um, but it, I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening, joining us for this virtual event. And thank you to both Rick and Tom for being here this evening. Uh, if you enjoyed this event, you can find many more like it on our website, townhallseattle.org. We hope you'll consider making a donation to Town Hall Seattle as your support will allow us to continue to provide events just like this one. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of Rick's book, Reaganland, America's Right Turn, 1976 to 1980, please use the link on this live stream page to purchase through our friends at Elliott Bay Book Company. I also want to uh, give a plug to Tom over at Finney Books. You can check out their website, finneybooks.com. And then finally, thank you everybody for being here tonight. Have a great evening. Thanks, thanks Rick. <laughs>